Well, just to catch everyone up, uh, David is now hiding from Saul, who has put an edict out to kill him. And so David is hiding in the cave of Adullam. And we're going to begin by looking at a couple of psalms that David wrote while he was in the cave. So we're going to start with Psalm 57. So please turn in psalm, to Psalm 57. And I'm going to read the whole psalm. It's not that long. Psalm 57. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wing, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me, Selah. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. Awake, my glory, awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your, and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God, let your glory be above all the earth. Now we're also going to look over at Psalm 142. Psalm 142. Again, when David was in the cave. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. Finally, our text for the day in 1 Samuel 22. So turn back, 1 Samuel 22, and we're going to begin at verse 6. 1 Samuel 22, verse 6. Then Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. Now Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. And Saul said to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse also give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For all of you have conspired against me so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there's none of you who is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. Mike? Good morning. I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, I normally like to come in here uh, as Marshall Dillon and uh, take over uh, the class, but today you get Festus because I've got back spasms and uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if Advil uh, you can OD on it, but we're fixing to find out <laughs> because uh, I, I went to the Mike Black School of Medicine if one pill is good, two is better, and three is fantastic. So um, if I, in the middle of the lesson, uh, pull a Dr. Strangelove and start choking myself, don't pay any attention to it. It's just the medicine. Last time we were together, we were... Um, studying David at the cave, and we saw that he had uh, family come there, and then he was joined by 400. But 
before all that, uh, David comes to the cave and he's all alone. And he stops. Uh, he had been on the run constantly, but here at Adullam, he stops. Uh, we are going to spend a bit of time this morning stopping with him. Uh, I want us to get the mind of David because I think it's a wonderful contrast to the narrative of 1 Samuel 22 of Saul's mind. The mind of David versus the mind of Saul. Almost parallel at this time, uh, verse 6 picks up with the narrative that Saul had found out about the 400. And actually, we are a bit in these Psalms ahead of, of that particular instance because David writes these Psalms from the cave by himself. Uh, the first Psalm I want you to see is Psalm 57. We're not going to go through the Psalms in detail, just I want you to get a flavor for his mind. Uh, both Psalm 57 and 142. We know he's in dire straits. That's an understatement. He actually has nothing. And it brings us to the thought of Psalm 132, verse 1, which is a song of ascents that says, Remember, Lord, David and all his afflictions. Well, all his afflictions are upon us in our lesson today. Here is his voice, Psalm 57. From the superscription, remember we treat that as Holy Scripture. From the superscription, do not destroy. It is assumed to be an opening line for a song or a tune that would be familiar to the people. It's called a miktam, and we have no idea what that is. So I just merely say it's musical instruction. Uh, verse 1, the psalm opens with a cry for divine favor. Be gracious, he says, and appeal to God to act favorably with an underlying acknowledgement that it is not deserved. Learn a very important piece of theology right now for your life. On the best spiritual day that you could ever have, you are filthy before the Lord. That's why it's so ridiculous to think that you can earn your salvation or you can produce good works that would be pleasing to Him to gain your salvation. It can't be done. We are filthy and we're under judgment, but God in His grace has saved us. Learn that and you will be far better than most of Christianity. It's a, his prayer opens for God's protection. For in you I have taken refuge, he says meaning that he has trusted God now and he's going to trust him in the future. And he gives us a, a figure to work with. Uh, it comes from Deuteronomy 32.11. It's the protective mother bird, the shadow of your wings, which tells how the Lord delivered the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt and brought them as a people to himself. He watches over the people as well as you and me today. We are his people. Verses 2 and 3, I will call to God most high. A designation, says Alan Ross, that emphasizes the majesty, the might, and the power 
of the sovereign and living God. Ah, now, notice this word calls. Here, I'm going to alliterate it for you. K-A-W-R-A-H. Kara. That is the word to call. It is simply a fascinating word. Someday, I want to teach a lesson on Kara. It is such an important word to teach us about our relationship to God. Let me just give you a, a slight story, small, insignificant story about Korah. Genesis chapter 12, Abram's called by the majesty and the sovereignty of God to go to a land that he's does not know where he's going. But he gets there, and when he does, he builds an altar and worships the Lord. He passes by the great trees of memory and the idolatry that's going on there in the land of Canaan. And here is this rather insignificant man and this band of Bedouins that are following him. And He worships God in the midst of all of this paganism. Just a little bit after that, the Lord Himself appears to Abram. And He says to him, to your offspring, I will give this land. So it's a repetition of the initial promises that He was given not in Genesis chapter 12, but Genesis chapter 11 at the end. That's where the epic of Abram really started. So it's a repetition of the promises. And as a result of that appearance, Abram builds an altar. Genesis 15, uh, 12, 8. And he builds the altar, and here is the word. He karah. He calls upon the name of the Lord. Here's what's significant about that word. The text of Scripture says that he went east of Bethel and he pitched his tent at Bethel on the west and I on the east. So here is the geography. Get it in your mind. Here are the two cities of the Canaanites. He is in the middle. He builds an altar there. He calls upon the name of the Lord. Karah. He never goes to a Canaanite city. Not one time. Stays completely clear of them. So, what are we to learn about the Christian life, the spiritual life, the man with a relationship, the woman with a relationship with God? Shouldn't we do the same Shouldn't we also stay away from the cities? No, not at all. This is particularly for Abraham. But get the visual picture here. You see, some people would say, well, what we have to do is sell everything we have, go find us a monastery on a hill, put robes on and hum all day. That will make you a holy person. Is that what the Bible teaches? No, not at all. Look at this. He builds an altar between two cities and he karah. He calls upon the name of the Lord. What is he doing? He is in the midst of the pagans and he's worshiping God. What are you and I to do? We are to live our lives in the midst of the pagans and call upon the name of the Lord. Not be some ascetics and get away from society because it's evil. No. Righteousness is in our heart and we stay in the midst of life and its activities. And we worship God from there. 
That's what's significant about this word, kara. Now David uses it. What is kara? In essence, it is the voice of the sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And he knows the sheep by name. He knows your name. He knows you intimately. The karah, the call, the worship, is your voice back to Him. That's your relationship. It's vital. It's fantastic. Look at the way David puts it. To fill out or flesh out the... The spiritual life. Who fulfills His purpose for me. To fulfill, to accomplish. The verb means to come to an end. The end of a matter. When we sign documents and we transfer something legally, we have it signed and then notarized. And the notary not only bears witness that it is you, but they put their stamp on it saying legally it has now been closed, this transaction. When the gavel comes down in a courtroom, the proceedings are over. They're finished. Psalm 77, verse 9. The psalmist asks, has God forgotten? Has He ended His graciousness? He asks. Look at that word purpose. Literally, all things for me. So not only a personal relationship, but a personal plan, a personal purpose in that relationship. Has He forgotten you? No. You are. Your hands, your feet, you're carrying the good news. And you are the example to the world as you are. So, it is a plan, a relationship with a purpose. And that's why you will be delivered over and over and over <laughs> in life. That's what you'll experience. I didn't think I would be delivered. I thought this was the end of it all. That's what Paul says. In Eastern Asia, we thought we were gone. We thought we were dead men. But these things happened to us, he said, that we might learn not to rely upon ourselves, but on God who resurrects from the dead. So powerful was his deliverance that he saw himself as a dead man walking. Look how he does it. Verse 3. He will sin from heaven and save me. There are two sins in this verb, verse. Two verbs to sin. We take them as a figure. And the reason why is because they cannot be defined. It stands for God's faithfulness in delivering us. Here's what I mean. In Esther chapter 4 and verse 14, Mordecai tells Esther, very famous verse in the book, if you keep quiet at this time, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Place. Some other place. That's it. What is it? I, I want to know. I want to know the date. I want to know the time. I want to know the hour. I want to know the year. No. We walk by faith and not by sight. We're just to trust Him. And He's going to deliver. And that's what He does. He sins from heaven to save me. Let me illustrate it more.
definitely for you. In that great 12, 13 hour epic by Stephen Ambrose, Band of Brothers, we followed a group of soldiers called Easy Company. They were of the 506th Regiment of the 101st Airborne. Easy Company. And they had now come to the end of hostilities. When he began the story, it was in their basic training. And then the war and the theaters of the war. And now at the end, they have no more hostilities. They're down in a little German town. So a few of the men decided they'd get in a jeep and they're in a forest, so let's go hunt us a deer and bring it back. That's what they did. They went out, they spread out, they found a deer, had him all sighted in, when suddenly they stepped out into a clear area and they stared. It was a Nazi death camp with Jewish men. Black and white stripes. And they lowered their weapons and they stared. They immediately turned, ran, got back in their jeeps, drove back to headquarters, and they were yelling, load up, load up. And everybody did. They grabbed their guns. You never know. Have they found another group of Nazis? What, what is this? I can remember specifically the line in that particular show. The major asked the private, what is it? What is it? And his answer was this, sir, I'm not really sure. They all drove up to the camp and they all stared and got out of the vehicles very slowly. The major gave that order. Get that gate open. They clamp it open. And the men from the 101st Easy Company, they went into that death camp. And some of those Jews put their bony fingers trembling up on their shoulders. Some fell at their feet and began to weep. He will send from heaven and save me. If you don't deliver, Esther, deliverance will come from some other place. Who could have imagined? Who could have ever dreamed that it would be our boys? Our boys, halfway around the world. They would be the ones designated in the providence of God to save these people. Boys from Cleveland and Denver and Dallas. Our boys. From some other place. Why can David be so sure? And why was Mordecai so sure about that deliverance? Well, well, because God promised it. He promised it to Abram. It was passed down to Isaac and given as well to Jacob and his sons. It is the promises. The promises that you are my people and I will be your God. On May 25th of this year, the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, reiterated the promise to his people from the river to the sea, we will destroy Israel. What a fool! 
What a complete fool. And that's being parroted on college campuses. What fools. Romans chapter 11, it could not be made more clear by the apostle that a remnant will always be saved and that God will save His people down through the centuries. Deliverance is going to come. Paul says in Romans chapter 11 and verse 29, look it up. He says that the promises are irrevocable. That means they'll never diminish. They'll never go away. God has a plan and a purpose for His people, Israel. And the story is not over yet. So, life may be short, it may be long, but it is a life certain in the promises of God that He will see it through for all of Israel. That's what I wanted you to see from this first psalm. Now let's go to the second one, Psalm 142. Again, let's get our mind around what David is thinking before his parents, before the 400, when he's alone. We open with verse 3. When? What is that? That's a providence. When is providence? Time, place, event, setting. He says, when my spirit grows faint within me. Faint within me. It's very forceful in the inspired language. The idea, his emotional makeup is dark and foreboding. We think of a word like being overwhelmed. Or we say depressed. It happens. Now, look at this. We would anticipate David saying something like this. When I call... God will hear me. God will respond to me. But he doesn't say that. You know, Roy Orbison said that if you want to have a hit, you've got to have a surprise in the song. Well, here's David's surprise in the song. Look what he says. When I cry or call, he says... You know my way. You know my way. The Lord is the one that has laid out the trail. He's laid it out before him before he ever got there. He has put in the path. The obstacle course, if you will. And therefore, he is confident in it. We're blindsided all the time in life. But it's all a part of the divine plan. We are walking through his plan. To us and for us. The Lord has laid it out and we can be confident in our lives because he is the one that has laid it out. Look, the path where I walk. Interesting. In the midst of the dark provenances of the life of Job. 23.10, he says, you know my way. You know the way I take. Again, in Job 31.4, does he not see my ways? Does he not? Count my steps. Your God is closer to you than your skin. He knows. Both David and Job expressed a confidence that God was aware of the troubles because He put the troubles in their way. Their present experience. And they express a confidence in Him, the plan to get them through. Mark taught us 
Luke 9, 22. What is Luke 9, 22? It is Jesus explaining the plan that has been laid out before Him. Here's what He says. He's going to be rejected by the elders. He is going to be tortured by the chief priests and scribes. He is going to be killed. And then He's going to be raised from the dead. That's the plan that God had already laid out before Him. What is your plan? What's my plan? Mine's going to be different than yours. Yours will be different from mine. But here's the plan. Hebrews 12.1 Throw off every hindrance and run with perseverance. The race that is marked out for us. Who marked it out? He did. He set up the parameters. He put together the obstacle course. What we are to do is not try to figure life out, but to trust Him through it. He's got the plan. And we can have confidence in that. Verse 4. Look to my right and see no one takes notice of me. It's the trial of loneliness. It's the trial of forgottenness. The verb to look, that's anthropomorphism. God doesn't look because He doesn't have eyes to see and to look. It's anthropomorphism. Expressing. David is expressing his frustration. Don't you see that I'm your servant and I'm here in this cave and I'm all alone? You promised I was going to be king. And look at me. Probably filthy dirty. Probably hungry. Probably thirsty. No one's at my right hand, he says in verse 1. You see, that's where the defender would be. I've got your back, we said. Back then, they said, I've got your right hand. He's so frustrated. His refuge has failed. You know that word failed in the Greek translation of the Old Testament means vanished. It's gone. Refuges fail me. He ran to Samuel. He couldn't stay. He ran to Jonathan. He couldn't stay. He ran into Philistine territory thinking he could blend in. He couldn't stay. They captured him. He thought his life was over. But God rescued him. And now here he is in a cave all alone. Now I want to show you something from God's Word that I think is really neat. He says... No one takes notice of me. The word means recognition. He's alone. He's frustrated. He has no answers for what's going on in his life at all. Guess where that same inspired, God-breathed word occurs? in the Old Testament. It's a verse that I often reference to you on the sovereignty of God and His divine favor for you. It is Ruth chapter 2 and verse 10 where Ruth looks up at Boaz and says, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you would notice me? I like to put both those verses together to illustrate to people. Both of the words are words of emotion. One expresses 
frustration. One expresses astonishment. You put them back to back, and it is the Lord's way of telling you and me that I am just around the corner for you. You feel depressed? You feel lost? You feel off target? See, David, you're supposed to be general, running around with all the flags and trumpets and horses, and you're supposed to be delivering Israel from the Philistines, and instead, you're filthy, dirty, hungry, thirsty, in this cave, all alone, and you're right on target. Because guess what? I'm going to rescue you, and I'm just around the corner. What happens after David writes these prayers? His family shows up. Now he's got a family militia. That's the first wave. What's the second wave? 400. Now he's got an army. It's as if they came out of thin air. God will rescue His righteous ones. Wherever you are, whatever the dilemma, the Lord God knows it. And He is going to save you. And He's going to save you on the same basis that He saved Abram, Isaac, Jacob, the sons of Jacob, and David, His King. Because He has a plan. Because He has a purpose. As I've said it to you before, I will say it to you again and again and again. The will of God goes through David. But the will of God goes through you as well. My friends, you are today the living, breathing, sovereign plan of God. Walk in it. Walk in it. He's got this. This thing you call life, that I call life. He's got this. And He's going to pick us up on His shoulder and He is going to carry us up the hill and we're going to make it. No matter what the circumstances of our lives look like. Well, that's the mind of David. We're out of time to get to the mind of Saul. We'll do that next time, Lord willing. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank You for Your goodness and mercy to us. Thank You for Your loving kindness. Lord, we are overwhelmed that You would stoop down and find us in this morass of sin called the world and called the system. But You did. And You set Your love and affection upon us. And not only that, but You, you have given us a plan. And we're walking it. We're just walking through, Lord. And we are listening to Your voice. We are the sheep by name. And we're going to make it. Thank You that You teach us this over and over and over again in the life of David. He is a king, but he has no kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen.